So um, we're going to get right into it. I'm going to ask a few questions, and then we'll open up to questions from the audience. Um, this is just a Columbia University graduate film program extravaganza. <laughs> Um, everybody here met each other, worked together from the very beginning on this. And when I say very beginning, I'm talking two th 2010, right? Not first me. year, okay. first year of directing exercise, right? And that was with Jessica and Deb. I guess that was my first year, Deb's second. Okay, so, and, uh, and from there, it then got into, it was a short film, got into Sundance. Um, you guys were at Sundance, and then after that, decided to make it a feature. And then it was Jessica and Deb, and then Laura came in, became involved, Andrew became involved, and so it's been this incredible team ever since. You did the first shooting in 2012, mm -hmm. and then you did some additional shooting in... 2015. 2015, <laughs> and then finishing premiering the world premiere at Tribeca on uh, 2016. So it's been an amazing journey of six years. Um, and, and many, many things like that. So um, first question for you, Deb, is can you talk a little bit about the inspiration? I know there was one particular story that I think started this whole idea for you as a film, and talk a little bit about that. Great. Um, so yeah, as Maureen said, um, first AWOL was a short film, um, not really with the intention of making it into a feature initially, but just its own small project. Um, I'm from this area, Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania, and I think I've always been really fascinated with questions about um, what choices young people make um, when they don't have a lot of options. Um, so, you know, Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania, as you might be able to see from the film, is an old coal town. Um, we haven't really had an industry there in over 40 years, um, and so there are not a lot of options available to most young people there. Um, and we have a lot of army recruitment. And I started thinking about you know, why young people join the army post 9-11, knowing what they might be getting themselves into, and also fascinated with why some people join the army and then leave. Um, and in particular, I really started communicating with this young woman, Skylar James, who had kind of become the poster child of like um, Canadian um, asylum seeking for, for US ex-soldiers. Um, and I started communicating with her on Skype. She had left the army and um, I was curious whether she had left for more sort of political reasons, if she had realized and started to have a critique about militarism or if it was more personal. And what was very interesting to me is that she both joined and left very impulsively and very much out of love and, and feelings similar to love. <laughs> um, and just how young she felt to me and how, how much those decisions impacted the whole rest of her life, potentially. Um, so it's not Skylar's story directly, but it was very much initiated by some things that she told me. Um, one of the things that I was struck by is there's been this long trajectory to make this film, but it feels to me like it's coming out at the absolute perfect time just in terms of what's going on politically in our country, the kind of issues that we're confronted with right now in this electoral season. Um, can you speak a little bit about that? I mean, the authenticity of every frame of this film is so clear, and, um, and, and it has the ability to resonate so much beyond that at this time in America, I think. Um, it, it was very exciting, I think, last week as the reviews started coming in and the, and the press started happening that Lola Kirk, our lead, was talking in interviews about class and disparity of wealth. And um, that was really exciting for me I, because I think that initially some people were seeing earlier cuts of the film and <clears throat> really wanting to talk about um, gay marriage or don't ask, don't tell, you know, some topics that maybe are not the pressing thing right now. And for me, this film in a larger sense was always about class and disparity of wealth. And we happen to be having this moment right now, in particular, as you said earlier today, around the elections, where a lot more people are talking about um, the realities of class in this country. And so I think the movie is 
hitting people in a different way than it might have even six months ago, which is awesome. Um, Laura, could you talk a little bit about just collaboration and, and your your kind of criteria for that? You, you're on quite a roll right now. Um, you've done uh, with Ira Sachs, you did Love is Strange, and then at, at Sundance this year, you had Little Men. You're in the process of doing a fascinating documentary right now as well, in addition to your narrative work. Um, talk a little bit about how do you choose your projects? What's, what's your, your criteria for that? Um, thank you. Um, you know, I, I started making movies in the middle of my life. I mean, basically, I went to film school in 2011, so I don't have a lot of time. <laughs> no, 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 really. I mean, I mean, I don't have a lot of time to, 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 to not work on movies that are really important to me. And I grew up in a working class family, um, and the reason I started making movies in the middle of my life is because I grew up in a working class family. And I went to Yale, I got a degree in engineering, I went to MIT, got another degree in engineering, started a software company, and I, got, I finally got to the point in my life where I could take, I finally felt secure to make that jump. And I went to film school. Um, and here I am, and I, I made a commitment to make movies about people that people don't make movies about. Um, those are working class folks, those are women, those are queers, those are gender non-conforming people, those are transgender people. This is kind of my body of work. Um, and so when I accidentally happened to see some footage that Deb was working on, I was at Columbia at the time, I was in the edit suite working on my eight to 12, and I looked over and I saw this video and I was like, my God, those are lesbians. Nobody makes queer movies at Columbia. And for those people who have been to Columbia Film School, you know that this is true. And so I, I was like, who is this person and what is she doing? So I found out and, and then when I got the script, I realized that this wasn't a queer movie. It really was about class and it was, since I grew up in a working class Catholic family, so much about it resonated to me and I love Deb's approach to class and the way the characters move through so many classes in this film. So for me, it just felt like, um, uh, th in, the, in the queer genre, this is not what you see very often. And so it was very important for me to put that in, in the world. So um, hopefully I can get to keep doing it. Great. Um, Jessica, uh, you've um, had qu quite a wonderful career in a very short period of time. You did an amazing feature film while you were in school, actually, called Electric Children, which did incredibly well. And, um, and this is now another one of your features, and you're also now working on billion, Billions on, t on television. So um, can you talk a little bit about how you could sustain this for this long of time in terms of getting this film made? <laughs> and particularly, you know, in the end credits, it was wonderful to see the kind of support that you all have gotten from labs and grants and all that kind of stuff. So can you talk a little bit about that? Because that really is the nuts and bolts of what independent cinema requires uh, here in America. Um, so you mean like sustain as like um, living? Uh, no, more person? sustaining of just the, the, the creative vision over a long period of time and how grants and labs and things like that fit into that, um, if that was part of your strategy. Oh yeah, for sure. Um, I mean, I think we're, we're really um, lucky. I think there's like a, a lot as our, at our disposal. Um, I have like a running list of like, I get people, ask, people ask me all the time, like sort of like what, they can apply for, and like I just have a list now that I like forward to people who ask me, like you can come back to me. But like um, for like producers, writers, directors, whether you're TV, um, f film, uh, all concentrations, fiction or nonfiction, I feel like there's so so much out there right now that you can apply for. Um, less if you're a man, but like <laughs> but for women um, and minorities, I feel like there's so much, um, and I, I've gotten to take part in quite 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 a few different labs and things um, that have been awesome um, but the reality is it's, it's super it's super hard um, and um, starting to work on billions now has been fantastic um, as sort of like a day job that I love um, in television and I kind of joke that I'm in TV school now because <laughs> I'm learning how to, to work but but um, like uh, for about three years I worked totally independent freelance in film and television and it it's really, 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 really hard to make a living and to live in New York City and to pay back those Columbia loans. Um, just surviving on independent freelance film producing, it's, it's very hard. Um, and so now that I, I have a, a day job in television um, and it takes that pressure off a little bit, it's a lot, it's a lot easier. Um, so I'm finding that balance now. Good. Um, Andrew, you were um, 
line producer on the first part of the shoot on this and then post-production supervisor. Um, you have become one of the hottest post-production supervisors in New York City in a very short I, period of time you. as well. Um, it's been an exponential growth and um, and as we know, it's it's an incredibly creative part of uh, producing. I hired him first in Electric yeah, Children. He did true. nothing that's before. That's true. You get credit. Um, and so it's, it's a very creative side of things that I don't think a lot of people know about. Can you talk a little bit about what post-production supervising is? But also, I was surprised until I talked to you before the screening that there's visual effects shots in this film, which I st I've seen it now twice, you. and I still can't pick them out. So talk a little bit about that, and then we're going to open it up to uh, questions from the audience. Sure. Um, the funny thing was uh, I was joking with Deb and, and Laura last week. Um, when I started making this movie, as Jess just pointed out, I had done one film as a post supervisor, and when we finished her, I've done 12. <laughs> so it's been a, that's been how long it's been. Um, you know, um, I always say that a film really doesn't uh, you know, I, I'm definitely of the belief the film doesn't really get made until post. Um, everything else is just collecting for when we get to make the movie. Um, so it's, you know, uh, for me, it's it's when everything comes together, it's, it's creative. And um, you kind of, the creative uh, relationships you have with people in post, with your editor, with your sound editor, with your colorist, with all of them, it's kind of, I think some of the most intense relationships you can have because the buck stops here. It's kind of like the decisions we're making now are what the film ultimately is. Um, and we were really lucky with this that, you know, a lot of very talented people that uh, I knew, that Laura knew, that uh, Jess knew, um, agreed to work for very, very discounted rates. Um, in terms of the special effects, because of the nature of, I think, how long the, f the film was shot over, the long period of time it was shot over, and the fact that we had these seasons that we were dependent on, um, meant that there were just continuity errors to a certain extent that needed to get fixed. Um, am I allowed to say where they are, De Deb? Can we? Yeah. Um, or, just, or just one. Yeah, so the big one for me is... Uh, the shot where uh, Brita is sitting on the bed and it stands and it's a tracking shot out of the window. We actually shot that in 2012 in the middle of the summer. So everything outside that window is is uh, created um, from, from other footage, but it's all created. Uh, and that was done by a guy, Alex Lemke, who me, me and Jess have both worked with before and has uh, a lot of uh, great VFX credits and just kind of did it as a favor. Um, the other thing we got really lucky with um, was... Uh, this was something that Deb was actually put onto by Film Independent, is there's a film school in uh, San Francisco, uh, the Academy of Art, which has a VFX class that takes um, actual shots from movies. You, you, act, you act as a client and the students do the shots for, for no money. So, you know, it's kind of a win-win. You know, obviously, you know, you, you're reliant on when their semester is, but it kind of... Uh, means they get to work on actual films while they're in class, they get credit on it, and we get things that would otherwise cost twenty to $30,000. Incredible, that's, yeah. that's an incredible tip, wonderful. Um, why don't we open it up to questions from the audience? So, yes. So I'll just repeat that. So um, he, he really loves the fact that it was not one of the coasts, that it was actually middle America that's represented in the film and wanted to know how do you go about with the pitch to be able to put together funds for something that's probably not an easy sell. So I don't know who, who feels best to... Well, um, in addition to being a lead producer on the film, Laura is an investor on the film, so why don't you talk about why you invested in the movie? Uh, it's true. Um, it's very unusual for <laughs> the producer to put their own money up. Well... Yeah, I guess. Um, you know, one, I, I, it actually really helps with my investors. You know, I, I invested in both of Iris Axe's last films. And a lot of those, and, and we actually made a, a nice little profit on Love is Strange. You know, so a lot of, and I brought a, a bunch of investors into that. And so a lot of those people came with me to AWOL. Um, and some of them were very interested in the story. And some of them were just interested in coming with me to the next film, which is I'm, I feel very fortunate about. Um, I think just to address Jess's point, um, being an investor and being a producer is twofold. One, I think your investors feel much more secure that you will 
you know, uh, y you have their, you, you will take care of, you'll be fiduciary responsible to their mo for their money. Um, and two, when you're spending money, you're spending your money. Mm -hmm. and, and so there's always that second thought about how do we do this, can we do this a different way? Um, but to address your point, you know, one of the nice things about this film is Deb, Deb and, and Jess and Andrew made this short that went to Sundance. And so we could use that. Deb is a first time director. Um, I'm actually a first time producer on the ground day to day um, as well. So one of the things that we could do was bring this short to them and say, look, this is kind of the genesis of what's coming. Um, and the reality is a lot of people don't read scripts. They don't want to read scripts. So you have to kind of position it and talk about Again, talk about that this just this is not a, necessarily a gay film at all. It is a movie about class. It is a movie about mur rural America, and really talk about how important those things are. And so we were very fortunate. We got uh, 13 individuals um, to come on board uh, and invest equity, sort of a capital investment, um, in the film, and uh, along with um, some uh, Kickstarter. Did you guys Indiegogo, do Indiegogo? Yeah, yeah that these got. And then um, seven grants that we got. So we you know, kind of packaged it together in various ways. But it happens. You can do it. Yeah. Um, in the, up in the front there, in the middle? The question was, what happens in the second, and half scene, scene, second to last scene, Raina and her husband, Roy? Um, I can tell you my interpretation, but I think your interpretation is fine, too. Um, for me, I think that, you know, Raina, which she says pretty clearly early on in the film, has never left Pennsylvania except the one time she went to New Jersey. And, um, and m more than that, she hardly even really leaves that little town of Knoxon that she lives in. Even like Wilkesbury, where Joey lives, is like a journey for her. Um, and so I think she's petrified and when her grandmother dies that kind of gives her this burst of, of boldness of kind of like everything I feel good about here is is dead and I don't have childcare so let's just do it um, but I think that she still needs to hang on to something and so Vermont was the daydream and when it's clear that Vermont's not going to work she can't really adjust to a, a different reality um, and so in my mind, as soon as they get to the border and she realizes that they're not going to be able to cross into Canada and she has a moment to stop and think, which is in the hotel room, I think she's already plotting, how do I, how do I get out of this? So that when she calls Uncle Gary, she's really calling Roy. Um, but if you had a different interpretation, that's fine too. <laughs> yes, way up in the front. Yes. How did the story evolve in the interim between shooting? You mean between the first half of the feature and the, of shooting and the second half? Mm -hmm. um, well, actually, we were talking about this earlier today because um, when Laura came on, we had already shot about what probably adds up to like 25 minutes maybe of the movie. Um, most of the meeting that first summer and the, the outdoor stuff that's summertime and falling in love. Um, and Laura wanted some rewrites. Lola also wanted some rewrites, our lead actress. Um, and we had time because Lola was off making much bigger projects. And so we couldn't just immediately start shooting again. Um, and so we brought on some script consultants um, who really helped me to, to think about what we already had and what might make the film stronger. Um, in particular, the part about um, actually going to Burlington, Vermont and living that utopia for a little while was something that got added um, and changed in the script. And um, I think it's all for the best. I mean, you want the actors to believe the lines they're saying and to believe the reality of what's happening. And so I think, um, you know, when an actress you really respect comes to you and says, there are some parts of this movie I don't believe and I want to believe it, it's good to probably change it. So, yeah. I think we have time for one more question. Yes, the woman right there. Why did you choose to leave it so open-ended at the end? Uh -huh. Joey. 
I will say also, I'm a co-writer. There's also Carolina, and she's not here, so she might have different answers for you. But Who, um, who also is from Columbia in the writing program. Yes. <laughs> I forgot about that. Yeah. Um, I mean, I like to, it, just in general, like I like to go to art museums with friends and hear like different ways that we interpret a painting or, you know, no matter what, even if you feel like you're spelling out an ending, um, people are going to bring to it their perspectives. You know, there are definitely people who have seen this movie in its like workshopped phases and thought it was heartbreaking and, and there are other people who see it and think it's really hopeful, you know? So um, I think people just bring to stories what they what they bring. I definitely have an opinion about what happens at the end, so it doesn't feel super open-ended to me, but some people feel that it is. Well, uh, I think that's our time now. I want to thank you all for this um, incredibly resonant and accomplished film, and just thank you so much, and enjoy the rest of Tribeca, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.